All right, well, let's begin by reading our passage this morning, the first 10 verses of Acts chapter 19. Acts 19, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> beginning in verse 1. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some dis uh, disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, No, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him. That is in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. And there were in all about twelve men. And he entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the people, he withdrew from them and took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. This took place for two years, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and and Greeks. Well, may the Lord bless his word again to our understanding this morning. Now, last week, um, we saw the Lord working through Paul to plant the church at Corinth. And we saw that it wasn't easy, right? I mean, gospel work is never easy. But as Paul persevered through the difficulties, which we always did by God's grace, he saw the Lord bless that work. When the Jews rejected his message, the Lord opened the hearts of the Gentiles uh, to receive it. When the Jews threatened Paul, uh, the, um, the Lord promised him protection. And in the light of that protection, he ministered for another 18 months. And even when the Jewish mob dragged him before the Roman governor, he didn't have to defend himself because the Lord turned things around on the Jewish mob. And the ringleader was the one who ended up being publicly beaten and remember, he later became a Christian, perhaps because of these circumstances. Serving the Lord isn't easy. There are so many things that stand in our way. You know, the, the main thing that stands in our way is us, you know. It's, it's our flesh, what the Bible calls it, the old man, our desires not to work, not to expose ourselves to the possible dangers and difficulties that would come. And even if we're able to overcome this by God's grace, we still have to deal with the fear of what the world might do to us because there will be difficulties, there will be setbacks, there will be enemies that we have to face. And, you know, sometimes those enemies are even inside the church, which is sad. But if we push through the opposition, Jesus promises that he will do his work through us, we just simply need to be faithful to push forward. Now, last week we were also introduced to Apollos. We might call him the, the George Whitfield of the New Testament, a Jewish believer. Even though he had a Greek name, he was a Jewish believer who knew the Scriptures. He was mighty in the Word of God. He had a natural gift to bring that message across in a way that would arrest the attention of his hearers. And this, coupled with his courage, made him a very formidable force, so to speak, an advocate for the gospel. But we saw that even, even he wasn't perfect, right? How the Lord had to supplement his understanding by bringing Aquila and Priscilla alongside to help. And I bring this up only because I want to point out that none of us are really self-sufficient, None of us are islands. You know, we can't do it on our own. We need each other. And so the Lord calls us to come alongside each other, to help each other, uh, learn more and to be encouraged to do what our Lord calls us to do. And then finally, we saw how Apollos went to Corinth to water the seed that Paul had planted and how he powerfully refuted the Jews in public um, this, as we know, would not only give uh, the Jews reason to pause and reconsider their position, which is what we usually think about 
apologetics and these types of defenses. But realize, too, that as the disciples would see Apollos and hear Apollos, it would also confirm them. It would strengthen them. Their conviction that they were doing the right thing, believing the right thing. And that reminds us as well that sometimes the debates that we engage in aren't just for the ones we're debating and not just for ourselves, right? Because this is what the Lord calls us to do, to strengthen our convictions. But it can also shore up the faith of those who, who hear us which is why we should strive to know the Word of God and to be able to defend the Word of God. Now, last time we noted that when Paul first came to Ephesus, he was coming to where the Spirit before had told him not to go, to Asia Minor. Paul didn't go there because he knew, well, of course, you know, if the Lord tells you to do something, that's what you need to do. But he realized God was not shutting Asia Minor off but that he had his timing. It wasn't yet time. Uh, you know, we need to, to learn to wait on the Lord's timing, and certainly Paul did as well. Sometimes you want to kick in the doors, but it's not time you know, for the gospel, perhaps, to go to this individual or that individual. We need to wait on the Lord's timing. And Paul did, and the Lord opened the door. And on his first visit there, he was only there for a short time. Uh, long enough to generate some interest among the Jews, but not really long enough to do any great work. And after Paul left, uh, God brought Apollos, and even though he only knew about the baptism of John, he still did a great deal of good, and he, he continued to water the seed that Paul had planted. Uh, God wanted to make sure that seed was not taken up by the devil. Aquila and Priscilla were left behind, and they continued to help with the work. But this morning, we see the Lord again brings Paul to establish the work, and this time, things really began to take off. Now, the first thing we see here is Paul's encounter with this interesting group of disciples. You know, Luke writes in verse 1, it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. Now, again, we're, you know, I think as we think about the ministry of Jesus in Palestine, as we think about maybe some of the places that Paul has gone, and as we look at some maps and some of the ruins of some of these old cities, we might think that Ephesus was a small town like many other towns, and it, it would be hard to miss these guys the first time through. Why, why didn't Paul see them? Well, the thing is, Ephesus was a very large city. It was the largest city of Asia Minor. And it had a population of between 250 to 300,000 people at that time. So it's quite possible that these disciples were there the first time Paul was there. They could have easily missed each other. And it's also possible that they had just arrived. We don't really know. But we do know this. If there's 300,000 people in the city and you happen to come across 12 men, this was a divine appointment. This was something... God had planned, and there was an important work that the Lord was going to do through these men. As Paul spoke with them, it's interesting. Uh, he could perceive, he could tell something was missing. I mean, listen to the question that he asked. It's not exactly the question I think we might ask somebody if we were probing their spiritual well-being. He says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? It seems like the more appropriate question is, are you trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you, have you heard the gospel? Now, maybe it's because, he, again, he saw something was missing. Or maybe this was his way of getting to the heart of the issue a little bit more quickly. But it is interesting what this question implies, okay? It strongly implies that if they had believed in Jesus they would have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In other words, those things should have gone hand in hand. Now, this past Wednesday evening, R.C. pointed out, and again, I, I want to be careful because, you know, R.C. Is, is he's a wonderful teacher. I would recommend to you everything that he says, but he did say one thing that, you know, we have to think about. He pointed out that the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and this is certainly true, was the Lord's way of showing his people, that is, the Jewish believers, 
that he was receiving other people groups into the body of Christ. That is absolutely true. Remember what happened on the day of Pentecost when God originally, or you know, the Lord Jesus being glorified, sends his spirit on his disciples. Everyone who received the gift of the Holy Spirit on that particular day was a Jewish believer. Okay? So as far as the disciples were concerned, the Holy Spirit is a gift Jesus has given to Jewish believers. So what about all these other many Pentecosts that we see going on? Well, again, I think R.C. is correct here. When Philip went to Samaria, many of the Samaritans believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and they were baptized, that is, they were water baptized. And when Peter and John came later and laid their hands on them, they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and that showed the believers, the Jewish believers, that God had received the Samaritans because he had given them this same gift that was promised to the Jews. When Peter went to Cornelius and he and his household believed, the Spirit fell on them. And when the apostles at Jerusalem heard what had happened to Cornelius and his household, they immediately understood what that meant. So then the Lord has also received the Gentiles into his family. Okay, so those events definitely demonstrated to them that God was receiving the Samaritans and the Gentiles without them first having to become Jews by giving them this gift directly. But notice that Paul's question implies that by this time in, in the ministry of the church, everyone who receives Jesus should also have received this baptism. And I think it's because the Jewish believers are already convinced that God was receiving everyone who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's what the question implies. But the problem is these did not receive it. Luke writes in verse 2, they answered his question, no, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And so then Paul asks a follow-up question. Into what then were you, were you baptized? And, and here he's talking about water baptism. Okay, water baptism would show that you are the disciple of the one who baptizes you. And by the way, Christian baptism was also a symbol of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul realizes they could not have been baptized in the name of, of Jesus because if they had, they would have known about the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we get the impression that when they're baptized in the name of Jesus, that means that you know, the person says, I baptize you in the name of Jesus, but that's not what it means. What it means is that you baptize basically in the way that Jesus authorizes you to baptize, and that is, as he says in Matthew 28, 19, as you go out to the nations and make disciples, baptize them. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're baptized in the name of Jesus, if you're baptized with Christian baptism, then you're going to know about the Holy Spirit because you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, if they didn't know about the Holy Spirit, he asked the question, well, into what then were you baptized? If you're not Jesus' disciples, then whose disciples are you? They said, we were baptized into John's baptism. We are John's disciples. Now, this is one of the reasons why I think it's very difficult to tell, again, who are these people? You know, who are these men? Are they Jews? I mean, were they in, in Palestine when John was ministering? Basically, he ministered primarily to Jews. Or are they Gentiles who maybe heard about John's ministry from some other disciple of, of John who was maybe Jewish? Well, they could have been either. It, it's really impossible to tell. But it does seem, from what they say, that they never actually heard what John had to say. Because remember what John said. Uh, John came out preaching to get the people ready to receive the one who was coming after him, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And John said that when he came, he would not baptize with water, but he would baptize with the Holy Spirit. And John was even, of course, there to baptize Jesus and to point out who the Lamb of God was. 
So it's unlikely that these disciples of John had at least gone very far with John. They didn't seem to have learned very much of what he had to say. Even Apollos had learned quite a bit more because he was teaching and preaching accurately the things that had to do with Jesus being acquainted only with the baptism of John. Now, I think it's also unlikely that they were Apollos' disciples because, remember, he knew quite a bit more and if they were his disciples, he hadn't done a very good job. But again, we have to be careful because we can't always judge a man by his disciples. That, that's something we also have to watch out for. Now, it's more likely that these men were probably discipled by somebody who was aware of John's ministry, but who wasn't a very faithful representative of John. I think if John the Baptist were to have looked at these men and saw what their understanding was, he probably wouldn't have been too impressed. Disciples, remember, are to become like their master. They, they sit under the master in order to learn from the master, in order to understand what he understands, to become like him. It's enough, Jesus says, that you become like your master, both in your understanding and in your behavior. And these men lacked at least the understanding part. Now, again, this, this reminds us of a very important thing. We are disciples, aren't we? We are the disciples of Jesus Christ, which means we are those who sit under him, seeking to become like the master. And our job as disciples is to be good representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ. As Paul says, to become living letters that are known and read by all men, which means when somebody looks at us, they should be able to see Jesus. They should be able to learn about Jesus. Well, that's a very high calling, isn't it? But that's why, again, he gives us the Holy Spirit. But these things don't happen just because we have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking here about sanctification. It happens only as we spend time with the Lord. We have to be in the Word. We have to be in prayer. And, I dare say, we have to be doing what the Lord calls us to do, because we never actually do those things. We never really grow as we should. Remember how Paul in Philippians 3 talks about his, his desire was to know his Lord? But I want to know him in the, in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. And you only fellowship in the sufferings when you do his will and suffer for it. You, we've got to do his will if we are to become more like him. Well, Paul now understands a little bit more about these men, and he knows what he needed to do in order to help them. And what he needed to do, of course, was to share the gospel with them because this is the only way they're going to receive the Spirit of God. We read in verse 4, Paul said, John, excuse me, Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him. That is in Jesus so he was, he was offering Christ to them. And when they believed in Christ, they received water baptism. When they heard this in verse 5, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And again, remember to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus was to be baptized in the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then next, they received what that water baptism was actually pointing to which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit in verse 6. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. Okay, now the fact that they spoke in tongues, okay, and remember tongues is not just babbling, and it's not speaking some kind of heavenly language that nobody understands on earth, but only the angels, and you need somebody to interpret it. But basically, it means speaking in a, in a known language that is unknown to the person speaking, okay, uh, but is known to some people group on earth. Remember when the disciples spoke in tongues on the day of Pentecost? You remember the people who heard the sound of the rushing wind and gathered and, and heard what was being said? How is it that we hear them speaking in our own languages, in our dialects, the wonderful works of God, okay? Now, the fact that they spoke in tongues and the fact that they were prophesying, and by the way, I don't think he means that they were foretelling the second coming of Christ and that they were predicting the future. But the word prophesying also has to do with, with uh, 
forth-telling or proclaiming uh, basically God's truth, His wonderful works. And again, I point to the day of Pentecost. When they heard them speaking in tongues, what they heard them doing was prophesying. They were declaring God's wonderful works, right? Well, these two things that, that happened to these disciples were not just for their benefit, but they were for Paul's benefit. Okay, it was the evidence that God had received them. And I think that's a very important point, okay? Um, as, as R.C. pointed out, as we've already talked about. And remember that during these different times, there were other reasons, okay, why this happened. Let me just bring those up right here. Sometimes there was a time gap, okay, between when someone believed and when they received the Holy Spirit. Uh, remember the 11 apostles that, I'm thinking about 11 because one of them was a, was a devil, remember, but the 11 were with Jesus and they were born again, okay? All during the time they were, were with Jesus. And you might say in a certain sense, in a very real sense, the Spirit of God had already baptized them into the body of Christ. They were born again believers, but remember they didn't receive the Spirit of God in this way, as they did on the day of Pentecost, speaking in tongues, prophesying for three and a half years. And the reason was because Jesus had not yet ascended and he had not yet been glorified and that was the evidence that he had ascended and been glorified. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit also is an evidence of that and it accounts for this time gap. The Samaritans believed and they were baptized with water, but they didn't receive the Spirit right away. Okay, uh, The Spirit was not given until Peter and John come down and lay their hands on them. And I believe that's because the Lord did not want this new church in Samaria to develop separately from the church in Jerusalem. The Lord was keeping the whole church together until the, the doctrinal foundation, the word was all given, you know, it was all laid. Uh, and so he wanted to tie all these churches together. When Cornelius and his household believed, they were immediately baptized by the Holy Spirit even before they were water baptized. So here's another variation. But that's because there was already a representative of the Jerusalem church that was present, that is Peter. But by this time in Ephesus, notice Paul expected that faith, water baptism, and spirit baptism would take place at the same time. Now again, R.C. tells us, and I think he's right, this is what we should expect to happen today. Now, the Lord has already shown us whom He will receive. He's going to receive everyone, whether Jew, Samaritan, or Gentile. And we need to be thankful because sometimes we forget we're the Gentiles, right? We become true Jews through faith in Christ, but ethnically, we were outcasts and strangers from God until the Lord, you know, showed us His mercy in Christ. We no longer need to be tied to a central church because the Bible has already been given. It's already complete. So when we believe, we receive this baptism. Now, we do have to make some distinctions here. Should we, do we believe that when we receive Christ that we should speak in tongues because we receive this baptism and they spoke in tongues? Well, sometimes we forget that tongues you know, had, a, had a couple of different purposes. But I've already shown you one. It was evidence to the people who were hearing that these people you know, had received the Spirit and they were received by God. But the tongues were originally meant to be evidence to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. He uh, says, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 22, So then tongues are for a sign not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. God had prophesied that he was going to speak to his people through the tongues of foreigners, but they still would not listen. But that was a sign given to unbelieving Israel that Jesus was the Messiah. So, again, remember at Pentecost how the people who heard were affected. Something was going on here. And if they had put two and two together with the Old Testament prophets, they would understand God was bearing witness to the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, again, because that was meant to be a, a, a something for the Jews and, and because of you know, other factors, we, we don't believe that we should expect to speak in tongues today or that we should expect to prophesy because God has already borne witness to the Jews and we know how that has gone. He gave them 40 years to hear the gospel and repent. Uh, 
and they didn't, and so 70 A.D. comes along, but he did gather his people out of, of, that, um, of that group of people. But his purpose for tongues is completed, and if we had time, we'd see for the charismatic gifts as a whole. But that doesn't mean that there's nothing that we should expect. So what should we expect? Well, in a word, power. Okay? Jesus said in Acts 1, verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. That is what the giving of the Holy Spirit is for now. And again, we might make even another distinction here. The, Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit places us in Christ, makes us alive, gives us the, gives us the ability to trust in Jesus. That's one part of it. Uh, he was also given as a gift, of course, and, and there were these different ways in which that was revealed through the speaking in tongues and so forth to demonstrate whom the Lord was bringing to himself. That, that's another thing. But let's not forget the Spirit was also given to give power, okay? And that's the element of this work that would continue throughout the history of the church to empower God's people to do his will. Now, again, this power can rise or fall according to how much we seek Him, but we should experience something of the enabling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so, I, I've said before on numerous occasions, when the, when the Spirit of God works in our hearts, He increases our love and so our zeal for the Lord. But there's another aspect of this that we need to think about as well. And that is that he can also empower the spiritual gifts that God gives to us to enable us to do them better and more skillfully than we could, of course, without him. Uh, that is another way in which the Spirit of God strengthens us to do this work. Now, lastly and briefly, we again see the rejection of the Jews and Paul's turning to the Gentiles. Since this is a recurring theme, I don't want to spend too much time on it. But he says in verses 8 through 10, or we read this by Luke. And he entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the people, he withdrew from them and took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. This took place for two years, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Again, we see the, the, the work escalating, snowballing, becoming uh, more and more powerful. Now, the Jews were willing to put up with Paul for three months, but by the end of that time, the battle lines were drawn. There were some who were resisting. So Paul took the believers and he withdrew to the school of Tyrannus, which doesn't mean he made them, you know, he, he enrolled them in that school. <laughs> Tyrannus is, is essentially a Greek rhetorician, somebody who teaches the art of speaking, though that wouldn't have been necessarily a bad thing to learn for the disciples. And we're not told whether he believed or not, but what Luke means here is that, that he, he was willing to let them use the facility uh, to teach the disciples. And this went on for two years. And because Ephesus was so populous and because it was so influential a city and because there was so much traffic going through Ephesus, the gospel spread from there to all of Asia Minor. So again, we see hardship and we see perseverance, but we also see results. And the reason why Paul was able to accomplish all of this, you know, besides, of course, the perseverance, was because of God's timing. Remember, he, he told Paul before, not yet. Well, now's the time. And now is really the time. Things really begin to take off. So he brings him at the right time. God's wisdom. You know, bringing Paul to strategic cities, not just little villages and towns, spending two or three years there. You know, just think about it. If we spend all of our time trying to save one individual... You know, all of our time evangelizing that person, praying for that person, uh, not much is going to be done. We have to think more broadly, right? But also God's power. When Jesus told his disciples that they would receive power, when he said he would be with them, he meant it. He didn't say it was going to be easy, but he did say he would be with them and he would bless them, and that's exactly what we see here. 
Now, let's not forget that what God did for Paul, he does for all of us. You know, he directs us to where he wants us to be at the very moment that he wants us to be there. And he's already given us the power we need to, to be his witnesses. So this should be a reminder to us that we need to keep our eyes open as we're kind of mixing around for these opportunities. And when they come, to do our very best to honor him in them by speaking his truth to others. Well, may the Lord help us to do that. Let, let's uh, bow in just a moment of silent prayer, and then we'll prepare to come to the Lord's table.